Who is allow everyone in? Just one person. No, there's two people. I don't know why people actually want to listen to this stuff. It's not even anything good to say. Right. Mindy, we could have titled this We Do Who Do. <laughs> why didn't we do this? <laughs> we should have done that. Yeah, next time we'll do that. Not creative enough. But we were trying to stick within the segments of what I, I wish, wish I, knew. I knew. It's fine. Yeah. But we do who do. There are a lot of things I wish I knew before I started setting up who do. And then after I finished, I learned more. I wanted to learn. I wanted to know first. Exactly. Welcome, uh, Antonio. Everyone. Greg, Ray, Richard, Travis. Will. Will's on. Yeah, I don't understand. Will, what the heck are you doing? Do you not sleep? <laughs> no, does he? <laughs> Will never sleep. Oh, he sleeps on camera. That's right. Never mind. I forgot. He sleeps when it's convenient. <laughs> Hi, Ian. Um, oh, it's gonna be a fun. It's gonna be a fun crowd. Welcome to MSP Geek Geekcast. What I wish I knew. Episode about who do episode one. There's nine people in here present. It's gonna be a it's a one-on-one -on -one session. This is gonna be a one-on-one -on -one session. <laughs> um. All right. So basically let's just give some background here i i'm i'm going through an rmsp two major migrations simultaneously we are moving connectwise manage to halo psa and we're moving it glue to hoodoo at same the exact time. same time simultaneously they're going to be done probably at the exact same time and they're probably going to be finished around the same time <laughs> um but what I've just finished doing, well, like we, when we started off a documentation, we had no idea what we were doing. We probably still have no idea what we're doing. And does anyone? Yeah, does anyone really? Exactly. But um, I decided to make it up. And all right now, our documentation is a mess. We don't know where things are. We don't know there's multiple, the same thing is in multiple places. We don't know which one is right or where to go find it. And if it's missing, is it really missing or are we just looking in the wrong place? And it's, you know, of course, playing that search IT glue whack-a-mole game doesn't really help. So um, I've spent the last lots of months creating a standardization of Hoodoo and uh, decided that we can probably, at least myself, I can benefit trying to give it over to people because I learn it better when I try to teach it, right? So at the very least, that'll help. And if everyone else wants to you know, chime in or watch or pick up on what I'm doing or have their own ideas, then that would be great. So that's where this came from. And then we just MSP didn't have- MSP Geek is also a user of Hoodoo. MSP Geek is also a user of Hoodoo. And therefore I'm using MSP Geek's Hoodoo instance in this demo. Um, so we're not gonna see everything that I have in on the MSP side, but we'll go through some of the concepts, ideas and whatnot. Anyways. Right. So after that in fantastic intro, um, for those watching at home uh, who may have not found us through normal channels, uh, we are MSP Geek, a free MSP community. Uh, my name is Kyle, and I'm joined today by Mindy, who is the expert in Hoodoo. Say that. Uh, I'm calling it now, ex Hoodoo expert. So uh, we have a lot of stuff to cover today in our very short time window that you've scheduled for us in the Zoom call today. Um, I don't know why Kyle thinks I have a habit of just like understating the amount of time it's going to take to do something. We've uh, never been, uh, this was planned, Drew, answered live. We planned this two days ago and now we're doing it. Uh, all right, so Mindy, take it away. All right, so first of all, um, we have a poll that this time was prepared in advance, right? If Kyle wants to run that poll, basically asking what documentation system you currently use if you use any let me click the button give me a second oh was, launching there you go and basically we're just looking to see like a, a lot of the platforms that are more modern or have recently come out basically take over the similar concepts that tiglu uses who do like copies that tiglu in some cases and whatnot uh, with some slight variances and i'm just wondering what everyone's doing because <laughs> it looks like every single person's on here so far. Um, everyone who answered, at least. Oh, 
someone's someone said my mind <laughs> which is accurate yeah you know because that's what i used to do once upon a time oh people are changing oh no i take it okay yeah i should have so... put other i'm sorry <laughs> There's a lot of documentation platforms out there, guys. No one's using pen and paper. That's pretty good. That's that's better than where we started off. True. Um, all right. So the reason why I want to know is because basically we're going to go through a, 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 the layout of Hoodoo. And some, talk, some of it will look similar if you're already using Hoodoo or IT Glue, and some of it will be brand new. But it looks like a lot of it's going to be similar. So um, for the IT Glue person, the way IT glue works is that you have configurations and then you have flexible asset layout layouts where the layouts are there to like complement or provide additional information around the configurations that exist. But basically everything's a configuration, all the computers, the switches, and network devices, and so on and so forth are all configurations. The way Hoodoo works is that everything is a what what they call a custom layout or an asset layout. Um, and what IT would call is a flexible asset. So you would have to actually create the asset, the layout specifically for the computers, switches, servers, and so on and so forth, whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, there are some good and bad things about that. Mostly it comes down to planning. Uh, if you plan it correctly, then, and, and correctly is a very, like, it's a misnomer term. because it doesn't actually mean you just have to know that with the first time you plan it out, you're probably going to redo it again. Um, I finished our standardizations and I'm like, you know what? I kind of want to throw it all out and start over <laughs> once I was done. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll go through it and, and go for it. So on the side here, this is the screen. We're in a demo company, Mendy Online Automation yesterday of Hoodoo and the way you can see similar to IT glue, the asset layouts are over here and things get dropped in over here. We don't have a configurations option above. Um, we do have some built-in assets that do special functions. Obviously KB art documents um, and you got websites, which does like the domain monitoring and SSL inspection that you guys are looking at, or that you have an IT glue built in. When you add in a website, you have the ability to select what you want to monitor or not monitor. And then of course you have the ability to trigger. Apparently hey. I have to include the HTTPS. Hey, Mindy. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if this is just me, but I don't see anything changing on your screen. Uh, which screen do you see? <laughs> I see Hoodoo walkthrough overview. Okay, that would be why. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, wait. Okay, how about now? What do you see? Uh, I see MindyOnline.com. All right. So basically, start I, over. Let's, let's, start let's start all start over. over. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delete this and we'll start it again. Um, but up here, we have the built in assets that exist, knowledge based articles, processes we'll get to, passwords, of course, is a password vault. Expirations is basically an automatically calculated field of any kind of expiration that exists in the system. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and I'm just going to show you again the websites I drew in there when you couldn't see it. Uh, it's great. You didn't see the mistake I was doing. But nope. There was another mistake. These checkboxes will turn off specific types of monitoring, or you can just leave them all on and, and get everything. But basically, if you're doing a parent domain, you'd want to have all of it enabled. If you're doing a subdomain, you want to turn off things like DNS tracking or who is or things like that that don't really apply to the child. Um, and uh, also, another nice thing that Hoodoo has is that there is website monitoring. So it'll tell you if you're getting a 200 status, if there's a failure on the website, uh, and it can fire an alert to that as well. Some basic stuff. Um, but that's just the general overview. Uh, here's a dashboard. I'm going to skim through this really quick because of stuff we have on here. Um, then we go to the partners, which we can rename. And this is how, how you get to the organizations. You have a general global KVs. Um, and then you've got your personal vault, which you can turn off to an extent, followed by the admin side. Um, so let's just jump into admin real quick. And 
the other thing we like about Hoodoo a lot is that you can customize a lot of stuff. And my mouse is literally hovering over design, customize the design of Hoodoo. Uh, there is a dark mode. If there is a dark mode. You can change the branding of things. Itila doesn't even let you do any of that stuff. But the more cooler thing is that you can do custom CSS. So if you're bored one night at 3 AM, you can literally pull up DevTools and mess around with a design, copy and paste, jump it in here, and you can modify any area of the website as long as it's being modified by CSS. You can just throw it in here and it'll load. Um, some more branding regarding like PDF handoff watermarks and so on and so forth, um, and some text on the login. But that's the design and customization layout that you can do for the UI. Um, inside here, you have the ability of setting, uh, this sets the primary name of this button up here, All right? So we have it to partners because MSP Geek, where you have partners, we don't have clients. Um, but as an MSP, you can do clients, you can do companies, divisions. So it's really geared for any kind of IT documentation you'd be using, not just an MSP necessarily. You can really um, set the stage for that so that, it's, so that it makes sense for the organization you're using it for. Uh, default time zone, of course, we're UTC. Um, this is an important checkbox if you'd want to prevent external sharing. We'll come back to what that is, but just know that when you do see it and you want to turn it off because it's not secure or you want to make sure things are not being shared out securely, you can go ahead and turn that on and it'll block everything from happening. Of course, we have the 2FA and SAML setup over here, followed by default settings for the password generator which we'll show later, and then how long it takes for the user to time out. So that's the general settings. That to like a bajillion days, No, please? no, no, we're not doing 2FA that. 2FA is so annoying. Um, the instance of Hoodoo that I'm running right now is a beta version. It is the latest and greatest beta version. So uh, things exist that you're not going to see in yours yet, but it is coming, like password folders. Um, and other stuff. If you see it and you don't have it, if you see it here and you don't have it there, it's because we're in beta and just wait. Um, what I really want to go through next is the asset layouts. This is where we go to actually create the type of assets that you want to document. And there's a couple of things to keep in mind is that you're not going to get it right the first time, probably not even the fifth time. As you can see, we have community vendors and MSP Geek vendors. They're the same thing. Um, some of them. I wouldn't say that they're not the same thing, but we use them for two different things, but they are basically the same. They're tracking the same information, but we're using them to separate assets into different things. So when you're talking about information security in general, asset is any kind of data that exists uh, that, that your organization has control over, right? Um, and that you have to protect it, whether or not it's information about your organization or a third party or private information, whatever it is, it's all classified as an asset. And it even includes things like uh, uh, devices, computers, phones. Um, it includes like hard copy files that's considered assets of the organization. Um, CDs, USB drives, uh, things like that are all considered assets. So if you, can, if you think about it like that, what we're really documenting is any kind of asset that would exist uh, for the organizations that you're supporting. A, for your own organization, as well as organizations that you're supporting. Um, because you want to have a good record of what those assets are. Uh, you know, asset management is literally one-on-one in compliance. Um, so being able to track that is going to be very helpful. Now, can we play with a new asset? Can you create one right now? Yes. Just for fun? Uh, I'm going to, okay. but you know, I'll do it right now. Um, <laughs> gotcha. So there's a couple options when you create an asset. They provide you some uh, out-of-the-box ones that you can used to start from a template basically uh because like i said it has a bunch of stuff built in and who does basically start from scratch set it up yourself so they give you some templates you can use um or you can literally start from scratch okay so let's just use i don't know request for change start from template and what happens is it creates you can see now we have two of them <laughs> uh it creates an asset which basically you throw the fields and you build the kind of data you're gonna track. And each field has a specific type of data it can handle. So you can do rich text, heading, checkbox, confidential text, 
Um, note that confidential information is hidden by default and audited, but it's not available in the passwords list. Uh, you do copyable text. It's just basically there's a button next to it. It'll quickly copy it into your clipboard. And you can embed HTML, so Lucid charts, YouTube videos, and other stuff. These are all things you can throw in as fields for an asset. Um, I'm not going to actually build one yet. The next thing I'm going to jump over to is integrations, and there's a reason why. One of the things that happens in an asset is you build in these fields that you have to create and put data in. And actually, I'm going to go back into um, our test, and I'm going to pull up an asset here. What happens is, is that when you have integrations that come in, um, it doesn't go into the asset here. So if we notice, here's my asset. It's, it's myself as a person, OK? Um, I have three sections here, OK? Each one of these sections came from a different integration. This one on top did not come from an integration. There's no card to resync or rematch or delete. This is just the actual information that's in the asset itself. If I edit this, it's going to ask for fields that we created. Um, you know, so here's my Slack handle that we created in the asset layout that allowed me to put in um, data to, in order to actually know what's going on with that asset. Okay, the rich text things we're going to come back to. They're really cool, and they they also act similar to the way documentation works. So we're going to come back to that. There's key things about that. And then of course we can link other assets that exist. So I can link it to like MSP geek um, and you can link inside the organization or outside globally. So it literally gives you a good way to build a full relationship. If only they had that in IT glue. <laughs> <laughs> that checkbox alone would save so much headache. Um, and then the email address and specialty that we can put in here, as well as the country. These are fields that we created to track the person or that we want to write in or we want to, we want to know about. And you can see these went up here, right? But none of this information down here is inside the field here, which is the key point I'm trying to make. When an integration exists, it's going to bring over what they call cards. And the card does not go into the fields of the asset. So one of the things that a lot of people like to do, I'm not one of them, but I know a lot of people like to do this, so I'm pointing it out, um, is to make a blank asset with no fields. Just create the asset for the integration to use. The integration will create the card, and it'll literally have like a blank area on top. And then down here, you'll have the information. And what you can then do is go back to the asset and create the fields that are missing from the integration. And then just that way, populate the stuff that you know you're gonna to wanna to track that doesn't come through from the integration. That's one of the things a lot of people like to do. It gives them an idea of what fields are gonna need and it prevents them from having to plan everything out. Like, oh, I need a first name and I need a last name and I need a phone number and I need email. Like if that's all coming already from 365 or whatever integration you have, why do you need it necessarily, right? Um, so that's something to keep in mind. The other thing is now the reason why I mentioned I don't like doing that necessarily. Um, one of the biggest questions that we have to think about that I've had to think about during our documentation setup is the question that comes up with compliance a lot. Uh, how are you checking to know that the configuration that's in place matches the configuration that's supposed to be there? Um, right, it's one of the things like stateful configuration checks. How do we know that what actually happened is supposed to be what's there, and and what's intended to be set up? Obviously, we have like auditing of configurations and so on and so forth. But you know, it's not great if someone if we lose track of that. Like, how do we know what the original setup was supposed to be? So, in my mind, what I prefer to do is create the basic asset layout, including all the fields that are needed that's going to be tracking the intended setup of the asset. And then we can build in the integration that's going to come through and attach a card and we'll see what's different. So, and just going through this example, you, we'd want to build a, uh, an asset for a person, right? We'd want to capture your first name, your last name, your email address, the company you work for, um, your email, your phone number if available, and your uh, Slack handle if available, right? 
Yeah. Um, those are the basic information we'd want to make sure that we know you were you and we can reach and out. How to do you we contact you? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and this is before any integrations, right? We want right. to make sure that we have the information captured and any additional information is a uh, bonus right. or verify, right? It's so, a verification. Yeah, a simple example right here on the screen would be, let's say someone changed my email address in 365 to mgreen at mendionline.com, right? Now I see that my email address is supposed to be mendy at mendionline.com and someone changed it to mgreen. Now I have a clear discrepancy that I have to go back and fix. I know what the original setup is supposed to be. If there are no notes stating, hey, this was updated, right? We can add a note here and say, well, if I was the one doing the change, I'd come in here, I'd update this to be mgreen because it's supposed to be the new thing. And then I would have a note. It said something like updated email address as per ticket one, two, three, four, right? And then I would spell that correctly because you know I use spell check. And then it would just come through here. And then I would see, okay, I'm green and I'm green match, or it doesn't match and I did it wrong. And then I'd have to go fix that. But the idea is, is yeah. Yes. So that's literally what I'm saying, right? Greg is that the cards should be what exists currently and the asset layout fields are going to be static as to like what should be there. Um, and as long as they match your golden and what I'm hoping for to eventually build out, I don't have anything yet, but I'm hoping to eventually build out a way to monitor and alert on a asset where a card exists and the fields don't match. And we can say, hey, we have a problem, go check it out. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the reason why I don't like doing that. A lot of people feel like the auto documentation, depending on what the asset type is, it's good enough and they have their auditing in place and whatnot. So they let go in that route. Um, yeah. Can you exactly. alert off differences? So we are able to, like the API, I think reports back the values of the card. So we can pull the card values, compare it against the values of the asset layout. And then if they don't match, then we can do it. It's just, it's gonna be a lot of work unless we can find a way to, uh, like some standard or similarity between the fields on the card versus the fields in the layout, right? So. I don't know. I haven't looked too far into it. That's just my future thinking of what one of the things I want to do and why I'm actually putting in the fields that already exist on the integration into the into the asset layouts themselves. Um, yeah, but as as a someone who's going like let's say I'm a technician who's rummaging through this and I pull up Mindy, I need to check your contact information. They're different. Mm -hmm. It's an immediate. Okay, this is something's wrong. I got to fix this. Yeah. Or I got to figure out which one's right. And then I'm starting to dig in to determine, obviously, Microsoft 365 is going to be more correct than our current documentation because it's live pulling, right? I can refresh that card or resync it to make sure that it's coming in accurately and no one changed it. Uh, and then I can look at re recent tickets for Mindy Online to verify that you did want your name changed, right? And I can make um, sure that it's there. So I'm just looking to see... I don't know if there's a way, Ray. I don't know if the revisions show you the changes from the card. I'm not sure. Um, it does look like Hudubot did something here. Let's go to this one and see if it shows us. It doesn't show us the actual integration cards. I don't know if they get included in the actual uh, changes. Feature request. But yeah, I mean, even what Kyle is saying, like we've instituted, you know, of course, for public safety and whatever, there's a see something, say something rule, right? Where you, you, you always be over aware and over cautious and call the cops or whatever, if something happens that you're not sure about. We instituted a similar rule in our organization in terms of documentation and client setup. If you see something that you're not sure about that may seem wrong to you, say something about it, All right? We made it a golden rule. <laughs> see Karen something, D. say okay, something. Karen D. That's great. <laughs> and basically, it if the technician were to run into a situation where something doesn't make sense, they would bring it up and say, hey, what, what do I do? What am I supposed to do here? Or I need to investigate this problem and figure out what's supposed to be there and then fix it. You're right. Greg pointed out that like trying to solve this in terms of a resolution is going to be a lot of work because how do we know who the source of truth really is? 
You're right. It's going to be, let's go back to previous ticket history. Let's find out who last worked on this ticket. Um, with Microsoft auditing because you change the email address and why. Exactly. Yep. It's going to be a lot of work, but ideally you're going to get to a point where uh, you crack down on enough people who aren't following procedure and then it stops happening. Yeah, right. That's, that's with anything, that's right? You you get people to follow process. You eliminate as much manual process as possible. You automate as much as possible, and then you you start putting checks and balances so that when the manual process ha happens, um, you you got a way to to fix that. Yeah. So the other thing I'm going to talk about regarding the cards before we move back to asset layout and setting one up is that. We have the ability, if a card matches incorrectly, because it does match on the name, if a card matches incorrectly, you do have the ability of rematching that card to something else, to a different asset. It could be a different type of asset completely. It can be uh, the same asset. So I can do people, it's just a new name. Um, or I can match it to an existing asset that already exists. Like I have a Mendy admin account. I can just match it to that one instead. Um, and it'll move the card out into that new asset. So it's no longer here. So you do have the ability of, of being flexible with the cards. Again, Ray, I don't know what that does for the auditing and the revision history on the, on the thing, on the actual asset, I'm not sure. Um, but if your asset from an integration comes in, goes to the wrong asset, if the integration card goes to the wrong asset, you can just rematch it. Um, so that's some of the other things that you should know about regarding the integrations. Um, let's look at an actual asset layout. So. We're going to start from scratch here this time. And I'm going to document, I don't know, network devices, let's say. So there are certain things that I know I need to document as a network device, um, if I can find it right here. And the first thing that we would want to do is basically what I've come to realize from building the standards. And here's the key piece, because I spent hours basically creating all these asset layouts and all the fields that they would want. And then I spent hours creating what information should go into each field, not necessarily just what information, but in what standard should it go into? So like, what should the format be? We want all assets that are network assets to be named in the same way. We want to have like manufacturer and then device role and then model or, so, or host name or something like that, that would always be the same. So that way, no matter where you are as a technician, if you open up the assets, you know exactly what you're looking at. If everyone's picking their own kind of name to use, then it's all over the place. Like some guy's gonna call it based off host name, then manufacturer, and then model, and some guy's gonna do just switch. And the other guy's gonna say, you know, like uh, the switch and location, front door, underneath desk, something like that. And it's just gonna be impossible to know what's what. There's no real standard and everyone's, it's always gonna be confusing. So I spent so long creating uh, not just on names, but every kind of field. Like, what is the standard for the document, for the information that's going to go into each field? Um, and then I was done and I went to Kyle and I was like, you know, I, I'm going to throw this out and start over. <laughs> because what I realized is that um, I did it wrong. The way, the, an easier way to do this would have been to identify um, a standard for each type of field you want first. Right, because if we can generate consistency, not just across assets, but across, not just within asset layouts across devices, but also across all asset layouts, then we can make it so much more intuitive and so much easier to learn. So I was thinking we can do um, first identify the standardization to use for each type of field that exists and say, hey, if I have a name field, here's how I want it to look, no matter what type of asset it is. If I have an IP address field or a management field or a notes field, this is the kind of information I'm gonna want inside of it, no matter, of, regardless of whatever type of asset layout it is. And then once you have those standards built out by, the, by field type, you then decide which fields go into which assets and you automatically create the standard around the asset, creating a level of consistency across the entire documentation platform. So, I, I'm thinking about something that I'm not even sure is going to work or how much like head or mind uh, energy it takes to do because I've only recently thought of it after I finished everything else after a couple months and I'm like, I'm not doing it, dealing with it right now. Um, but that's just one of the things you can think about when you are coming and planning out your asset. Um, so aside from that, 
let's go through and I'm doing a network asset. I'm going to have a name. The name is going to be the default field of the actual asset itself. But what are other things that I'm going to need? Um, I'm going to need an IP address, right? So we'll put that in and we can put that in as a, uh, I think it's a link, all right? Link to external website and IP addresses. So it actually makes it copyable and linkable. And I'm going to show this in the list so that it shows up in the grid. And then I'm going to put a hint to help the technician document. This is the management IP of the device. And then I'll make it required. Um, I'm only going to do a couple more fields here because I want to get to the point of what I'm actually doing. Next, I'm going to do a copyable text, and this is going to be a MAC address, right? I want to know the MAC address of the device. I'm not going to put this in a list. And again, as I'm going through this, I'm thinking it through, like, do I need the MAC address in front of my face on the table, right? Well, as soon as I open up the list, the grid view of devices. Some people are going to say yes, because, you know, it's easy and it's in front of your face. And it's, uh, in some cases, you don't know anything about the device but the MAC address. But in our case, I'm not, I don't care about the MAC address. I can search that globally within the client, if I, if I have the MAC address, I don't need it in a grid view. So I'm gonna hide that. I'm not gonna show it in the list. And I'm just gonna put in this is the base MAC address of the device. Okay, so now the next thing I'm gonna put in is I'm gonna put in the physical location, right? And in this case, I'm gonna do rich text field and I wanna describe physical location. And again, this is not gonna be in the actual list. I'm just gonna put in Describe the physical placement of the device, and where it can be found, right? We can include pictures, it's a, it's a rich text field. But here's the thing that we can do. Um, number one is that we are putting in, <laughs> we are putting in information that in some cases may be useful to be in a table, but in other cases, it's too much. Like we can't put an entire rich text field in the list, it's going to be like if you go too much, the list is going to go off the screen, right? But we also want the technician to know that there's information in that field that they that they care to see, right? The other thing is is that we can use headers to organize and separate the assets, so it makes it easier to to view. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to create a header, heading, sorry, and it basically is it's just a separator, right? So we'll just put in um, this is going to be physical information, right, or something physical info and you can come up with better names for it. Obviously my brain's not working properly today. And then I'm gonna put in a checkbox, check this out. And here I'm gonna say pictures attached, okay? And I'm gonna put this in the show and list. I check do this have box. A template. If you have pictures that exist. Greg wish they provided a standard template um, for I guess information you wanted to collect. Um, can you save this as a template? Mindy? Um, you mean like for, for to copy it again or? Yeah. Yeah, I just hit duplicate. Yep. So, so you, you, can, you build can build a, a base template. layout and then like build it off of that. Um, but notice that what I did here is I have the physical info uh, is a heading. I've got the physical location with which with potentially pictures, right? And then I have pictures attached checkbox, which is going to be visible in the list. I'm going to rearrange these fields. The top two are going to be network related. So I don't, that's not part of the physical info. We're going to put the physical info underneath that, the location rich text field, but I'm going to put the checkbox above that too. And we're going to save that order. Now, if I go to the partners and I go jump here and then I did not activate the assets and so now I'm going to go back <laughs> and activate the asset layout. My bad. Okay. Editing the asset layout. Here is where you can actually change the name of the asset layout, the description. So I've been using the description to help train, like put in information about what to put in that asset. So the technician opens it up. It's literally, everything's in front of their face. It's easy to follow. Um, uh, the client. And we can choose folders as well. I'm gonna leave it out of a folder for right now, but you can have different folders for networking, operations, systems, like things like that. Um, and then you can change the name of the, the first top level, which is the official name of the asset. You can change that if you want. Um, if you did a drop down, then you can just literally put one per line and it would put a drop down instead of a free form text. These are different things, abilities that you can put in. So every asset has the ability to have a process, which we'll come back to, passwords embedded into them, which we always have, pictures, 
Uh, I'm going to turn that off because I want the pictures to be inside the rich text and then files for like configuration stuff or whatever. Uh, and then I'm going to turn off comments because they're just annoying and nobody looks at them. And here you can use, this is uh, the font awesome uh, stuff. If you don't have an icon that you want to use here, literally you can just look up any FAS font awesome solid icon you can put in here and it will load. Um, so you can go online and pick whatever one you want to use and, and use that. I'm just going to pick something from, I don't know, networking, which is somewhere here, somewhere. Uh, eh. Right here, that one, network wired. So we'll update that. And then you can also change the color. I don't know if you saw it up here, if you want to. Right here, main color and icon color. You can make it really ugly to match the theme that you have. Um, so let's go back and did I actually activate it? I don't remember. I don't, I don't think, think I did. I don't think I actually activated We're gonna try this one more time. Yeah, there's a button, just click activate and it makes it active. Here's the thing to note about assets. You can hide assets by deactivating them without losing your data, okay? So if there's stuff there that you don't know if you want to, but you want to stop people from putting it in there, you can just hide it. And then at some point you can go back, re enable it, find the data that's there, and then move it out into the correct assets. Just some things you can use to help you clean up. Did you talk about folders? Um, I did, I very briefly did. Just create a folder here, we can, we can do it. Oh. Yeah, but so like in this example, be network devices and you create a switch device and you could lump that into network. Right. So it all depends on how granular you want to get, which comes back to your planning, right? You can literally do network devices and then put switches as one asset, access points as another, routers, firewalls, each one is its own type of asset layout. Or um, if you don't want to spend your entire day documenting literally 24 seven for the rest of your life, you can make it a little you less should. granular. You should. <laughs> Which you should be doing. You can make it a little less granular. Um, we have a network folder, and inside there we contain um, a network devices asset layout. It contains like switches and far and and uh, access points. Um, we have a separate asset layout for firewalls that goes into the networks folder. We have internet WAN. We have the VLANs themselves. Each VLAN is a different asset layout we created that goes into the network folder as well, um, and some other stuff like that. So. It all depends on how granular you want to get. When you create the folder, it doesn't show. Actually, I think they may have fixed it here. It is alphabetical, uh, but I think in the other older versions, it'll actually be displayed in the order you created them. But on the actual pages, it will be alphabetical. So if you want to order it, throw a number in front of it. You know, the good old fashioned way of ordering folders on a drive map or whatever. Um, I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to dump this into that folder that we said uh, we just created network and tip by the way you don't have to go to click the save button if you're in a single text single line text field pressing enter will also trigger the submit and save the work so something i've been using a lot as i've been jumping through lots and lots of assets and updating them one by one in various places um all right so here's our folders i'm going to hide community and operations we have network um, one of the things you can do down here is hide blank assets. So you can literally only see the assets that have something in it. Um, or you can show it blank and that way you can see all of them. Uh, so we're going to go into network devices and we can see here, notice I have the three things that we're doing. I'm just going to quickly document a switch. Um, base switch one, neck ear, S3300, whatever. Can you make it a not neck ear? No. And then I don't know the MAC address. And seven HDMI ports. I'm going to grab a quick picture and I'm just going to throw it in here. And it's not going to be a real picture of the switch. And just type in Netgear switch. Too late. Uh, I just pasted a picture directly into the rich text field, which I don't, I, maybe IT would finally fix that, but it wasn't something that you were always able to do. Um, the thing about this, I mentioned it's like a document. It's basically the same abilities of a document. There's a button in here that allow you to go full screen. And then you can literally document the crap out of the, the device. So you can throw like a whole long document and it'll show up as, you know, you can minimize and save it. And what'll happen is it'll show up under the notes right here. Physical position, here's a picture of the switch. You can see this nice switch right here. Um, and the pictures attached is a checkbox. So if I go looking at the grid, 
I have a bunch of devices, I can easily tell that there's a picture attached, even though I don't have the notes showing up. Um, I use that trick all the time. We have, well, we'll get to it. One of the things that I'm gonna, I'll do right now is, um, I'm actually gonna switch over to knowledge base articles, and then we'll come back and continue enhancing all the asset layouts. Actually, no, I'm gonna stop for a second. And we're going to go talk about permissions and the user setups because hey, that's uh, more important. We're talking about that. I'm going to push the poll that we should have pushed probably earlier. Uh, oh, yeah. How, go ahead and do that. <laughs> how many of you uh, have and follow documentation standards? I forgot about that poll. <laughs> this is the second time I forgot about that question. Uh, um. What are standards? We have them, but do not follow them. We have standards of, oh, that's okay. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. One, one person. <laughs> yeah. Oh, two I'd people. Suspect. Anyone who voted for we have standards and follow them, suspect. <laughs> I've been in this space long enough to know. Yeah. There's it only one. Building standards. We should have added that option, Kyle. Building standards. That means he work in uh, progress. What are standards? That means what are standards? <laughs> Trying to figure them out. Um, all right. So one of the things that recently was redone, and I say recently, I mean like um, I don't know, five or six versions ago, maybe. They redid the groups, the permissions that you can do in the groups, and it is way better um, than what it used to be. So I'm just going to say like uh, partner technician. And notice, like you can already see the different options that we have. So we can tailor the dashboard to the partner. We can remove access to global KBs, which is this button right here. We can disable the personal vault, which is this one over here. I mentioned that. And then we can also remove access to share partner passwords and the agreements, right? So you have a little bit of control over what can be done already just from creating the group. I'm just going to set uh, these things. Okay. So this one basically turns the group from allow from deny listing to allow listing, where by default, if you're in a member of a group, um, you stay open, like it, like you have access to everything, and then you add companies to the group to deny that access. And here, we're turning it into an allow list where they don't have access to anything at all, and you have to give them the the organizations into that group in order for them to be able to see it. So we're going to create this group. And we're going to get a whole list of other nice things that we can do. Hey, Mindy. What's up? We have a really good question. Does my glue exist in Hoodoo? Yes. Right? Is that the question? Well, do, does Hoodoo who, who who do. Who do have a comparable end user password manager such as my glue? Um, I've never touched my glue except for with one client, and they were not happy with it. They said it was a steaming pile of who knows what. So I have no idea. I don't even know what comparable would be. Um, I know that in terms of like a read-only user, they do have something similar to the port to the portal. Um, Steam pile of glue. <laughs> uh, in terms of like my glue, I think that you would literally just have to create a regular license and grant them access to just their organization, similar to the way I'm setting up the group right now. Um, but I think that's that's going to be the best answer right now. They don't have a separate entity that would be used because my glue is not just passwords, right? It's a whole thing like, oh, empower your own client with document with their own documentation it allows them to build their own separate set of documentations, which you don't necessarily have access to. Um, it's two separate systems, and then they can share between my glue and IT glue. Uh, so that does not exist. Um, but you are able to grants your clients a regular user access to a specific client or a group of clients. Um, and again, it's just a regular user license. Show the real-time tracking stuff. I'm not sure what that is yet or what you mean by that. But in the group itself, going back to this part, if you want to make changes to what you did, you can just edit the group um somewhere i actually don't know where yet i think it's under here maybe yeah so you have it like same same settings are over here on top 
but you also have the ability to control what asset layouts the group can see. Yeah, okay, so you're talking about the processes, Ben? Um, we're, we're getting to that. Yes. Uh, we're um, on beta. We are on the beta version. If you want to see that, it's 215.13. We are on beta. So, but this currently exists in the released version, the general release. Uh, so here you can deny asset layouts. So you can build a private uh, asset that you'd want to not necessarily block them from seeing the client, but you can all you can restrict that asset layout specifically. So that way you can store private information in every client without having to worry about it. Um, other restrictions that you can do is you can change specific, you can specifically restrict uh, or uh, you do it from the, from the other direction, but you would basically go under the asset itself and say, deny this group access or something like that. And it would show up here as other, uh, under other restrictions that you would then be able to manage and control. You can set a login schedule. So you can say, well, this guy is only supposed to work from certain time to certain time. So I'm an Eastern time zone. If I can find that on here quickly, it's minus five. Boom. So I can say, look, I'm only supposed to work from 8 a.m. to you know, 5 p.m. and only on Monday and Saturday and Thursday, right? Now, if he cannot log in, that person can't log in on any, any of those other days. So you can create groups around shifts to make sure you're um, closing that gap. If someone compromises the user's password or something like that, they can't log in unless they happen to do it during the time of the schedule. Um, Right again, compliance is like, how do you know that users are not doing stuff outside of the normal work schedule? Right, that's how you do it. Uh, right, I mentioned this is an allow list. You add in organizations here, and then it lets them see um, that organization. Or alternatively, you can switch to deny list, and it will allow them to see all partners, and then only deny Menti online. Um, you just switch back and forth. The final thing is, of course, adding users to the group, uh, which we I don't know if we have anyone that we can add in because everyone's an admin. Uh, that's one of the things I don't like and something that's hopefully changing soon, but no timeline. Uh, you cannot add admins to groups. Admins are granted everything. So there's that. Um, but that's how you do groups. And that's one of the reasons why I want to cover it first is because the ability to actually set when you're building out your asset layouts, you want to think about things that you don't want necessarily to be seen or, or if there is anything that you want to restrict and how you would restrict it, you want to have that planned out in your security groups as you go. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, which is why I wanted to go cover that first. Moving on, um, one of the other ways, just real quick, when you create a user is you can actually create the user and decide, are they an author, portal member, editor, Right, so portal member is going to be that free license where they have access to the client portal side of things. It's not quite Kudu or nowhere near my blue, but you have, they have access to some of the stuff. Spectator is read only basically. Um, and then of course, author, they can write stuff, editor, they can edit stuff. Admin, you lose the ability to add to the group. But other than that, you can add them, any of these into groups. So you can build, you can limit your company as a portal, I think. And let's see if there's a group underneath. Come on. Yeah, so you can't add it to, you can't add any portal members to groups. It's, it's, it's a special type of user. Um, so spectator, author, editor, you can add to the groups. And then that's basically it. You can invite multiple people at once, but at this point, you, that's stuff you can just figure out. Um, going back before, we go further. I'm just going to pull up this global KB that we did here. Um, the documentation editor is really cool. There are things in here that allow you to control the flow of the document. Um, callouts are very important, right? So I use callouts all the time because um, if I want to draw attention to a point I've made, Right in the document, so people like everyone knows you're reading a document, your eyes are starting to blur, especially if it's a longer document. Right, you want to be able to draw, like, throw a call out, out there to remind, like, hey, this is an important part. <laughs> so, if you want to read this and then read around it, so you know exactly what I'm talking about when you say that one thing, right? So, like, if you're describing 
the scenario Kyle had where he accidentally ended up deleting all the data on the SAN, right? And you had a document around what steps you should be taking, there would be a call out that says, clicking the wrong button here could delete all data. And then that's going to catch your attention. Like, oh, okay, I need to read this. <laughs> Why are you um, talking about me deleting stuff off a of SAN? I ain't never done that. No, of course not. Sorry. Um, so the other cool thing about it is, of course, headers will generate an automatic table of contents, uh, which I'm going to get back to in a second. One of the things that we did when I was building my document, so I built our documentation standard on how to document in Hudu. So we have a document on how to document in Hudu. Um, I'm going to go to this KB article here that we have in this folder, Hudu walkthrough. This is the, this is the link I shared earlier. Um, and the way I did this is very similar to how I built the, the same thing. This is just a list, right? And then this is a header and this is more headers. And then I'm basically recreating the list as headers where I can then um, put more information around it. And the reason why I'm doing that is because what I found myself doing is while I'm writing this document, I ended up with a document that would take literally 30 minutes to read, <laughs> right? No one's gonna sit down and read that document, especially when it's a reference document. You don't have to read the entire thing. You just need to read the area you're trying to get to. So what I did is I basically copied the, the sidebar table of contents. You can literally create a link to any header that exists. So I'm just gonna create a hyperlink here and notice if I hit the, boom, I have a list of headers I can click on that'll link it. Now it happens to be this is broken. So if you use that, I don't think it actually works. Let's just try it real quick. If I publish it and then I click on, yeah, it doesn't actually take me to the right thing. What you need to do is find the link here and then grab this text, but it's really just using a hyphen for every space basically. So if I edit this and then change that link one more time, to be pound, it basically creates an anchor. Anyone who knows HTML, you have an anchor tag, and then you can create a hyperlink to the anchor tag by doing a hyphen, uh, not a hyphen, a, a hash pound, and then the name of the anchor, right? So it's the same kind of thing. It's creating an anchor in the document that you can just jump to um, in the current window because I don't, not making them leave the document. And then when I publish it, it's gonna actually take me to that area, boom. Right, so I, you can build your own table of contents. The other thing is as you get a really large document that's created, right, scrolling up and down is a big pain. Well, you can literally just throw in a link at the, t at the bottom of each area. It says jump to top, right? And you can format that with a nice little color so that it's visible. I don't know what I'm doing. It's gonna look ugly. That's yeah, fine. <laughs> Hyperlink, and then again, I'm just gonna grab the, basic concepts to run through, which is the very first header that I have. You can call it overview, you can call it whatever, right? It's up here. And then my link, I can put that underneath each area and then it'll just jump me back to the top, assuming I did it correctly, which I didn't for some reason. Um, let's do that one more time, but you get the idea of how to do that and how that helped. So like, I have a document that's 39 minutes to read, like I said, but oh, I spelled something wrong or was it, maybe because maybe it's case sensitive. Um, no one actually reads the whole document because they don't have to. They just have to literally like open the document. They see the front overview. They jump into the area of the asset they're trying to document. They click on a button. It takes them to that area, which outlines the standardization for that asset. When they're done, if they need to go to the next one, they click the jump to the top, they click on there. And they literally, it's a, like a live document they're jumping up and down in order to get around to figure out what they're supposed to be doing. So I jump here and I can jump back to the top and then so on and so forth. Um, so that's one of the things that, are, that I want to show specifically in the documentation uh, side, the advanced formatting, the callouts. I didn't actually show you how to do the callouts. They're very simple. Um, up here, it tells you what kind of information you want to be pasting in. So here you have the different callouts that exist and it's very easy to do. So if I do success, I have my success callout. 
right? And then I can change that to, I can add another one by pressing enter, change it to warning, and then another one by pressing whatever, and then so on and so forth. Keeping in mind, of course, that everything I'm doing here, the same rich text editor exists throughout the platform. Okay, so um, one last point, and then we'll jump back to asset layouts, is that notice here on quick notes, right? People seem to miss this because when you don't have any quick notes in here, it looks very empty and it's a very tiny area. But there's an edit button right here, right? So let me just see if I can just grab all this crap out and show you what it looks like when it's empty. Yeah, it's like, it's not there, right? There's a tiny little edit button. And then it's really a rich text format. Again, you can go full screen. You can literally put a whole freaking document on here. You can throw pictures, dash, like whatever it is that you can throw into rich text, you can put on here as well to help provide information, guiding them on the client. And I'm just going to throw this back in here because there are examples of what I'm talking about where we have two callouts that exist, right? And when they first open their client, the first thing they're going to see is, hey, customer has onsite technician help. It's like, great, perfect. I can make this a link. It takes me to the person asset. So I know exactly who it is, right? And then, by the way, there's ongoing internet issues. We suspect something, someone is using all the bandwidth. Probably that onsite IT guy because you know he's an IT guy. And he likes to use bandwidth. Um, you can link a ticket number and so on and so forth uh, into the quick notes, which is what they're designed to be used for, right? <laughs> At the score bridges quick notes. Um, so that's that's that. Let's go back to the assets and. Uh, I'm going to show one more thing with them, and then we're going to move on completely out of this area into some new stuff. So one of the things that I do, we did for almost every single device or every single asset we're doing is I created two additional fields. Um, one of them is I just call like a banner, basically. And then um, we'll just call it banner details, actually. And this will be rich text, right? And we'll put in, uh, put any... Uh, notice banners that are temporary for the asset in here as a call out. And then we are going to move that to the very top. Actually, before I do that, I'm just going to add one more field and this will be a check mark. That's going to say uh, banner notice. And we're going to show this in the list. Okay, so again, I'm using the same kind of trick where I'm creating two fields, one to show in the list and one to actually display the information. Um, and I'm going to rearrange them and throw the banner notice on top, and I'm going to throw the banner details right above that. Sorry, banner details right below that. Save order. And then we are going to go look at the network devices and see what it oh, looks hey, like. Spoon bot, Ray. Inside the network devices itself, if I edit it, we now have two new fields. I'm going to turn this on and I'm going to say in a call out, danger, this is a fake device. If you see it, something's wrong. Okay. And then we will update that. And what's going to end up like, boom, it's on the top of the thing. They're going to see it as soon as they open it up. So, which is really nice for us because when there's something going on with something, you know, you don't know if they're gonna notice that in the notes, if it's at the bottom. You could do the same thing with notes down here in the same rich text field, but having the banner on top of the asset makes it easy, more visible and separates it out. So we've got a bunch of different rich text fields uh, spread out throughout the layout for different types of reasons that will basically allow us to use advanced formatting to make the asset more easily read. Um, with the banner notice checkbox enabled, again, if I had a list of devices, I would be able to see clearly that there's a notice for this device so I'd want to go look at that. If I pull up the client, I look at devices, I want to know what's going on in the environment. So I want to see each device that has a banner so that I know what those notices are and what I have to be aware of. Um, if that was unchecked, it would actually look like an X. Um, it would be nice if they had the option of no, nothing at all, but let's just remove this real quick and then update that. And then you'll see what it looks like without it. So it's got no banner notice. The actual banner details is missing because there's no value, right? Here's the header, the physical info we're looking at, pictures attached. And then we go look at it in the grid and we'll see that there's no banner notice, but there is a picture attached, right? So that's how you can use the fields and the asset layout to really drive 
or build a picture around the documentation you're trying to put into the system. Okay, that was asset layouts. All right, now next? we're going to security groups. No, oh, we did that. We did that already. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> All right, we've done. Yeah, let's look at the overview for a second. <laughs> we did asset layout. We did security group. We did basic customizations, um, integrations. We've discussed. We didn't just talk about the integrations that are available. We didn't talk about the integrated, but I'm not going to. There's like just there's a lot. Just go to the admin side and look at it. You can, you can, there's like a mapping integration. You can basically create a map around your client's address automatically. Where the heck is it? It's right there under account administrations under integrations. Yeah. Um, you can see there's a bunch of stuff in here. You can do Mapbox, Halo PSA, Repair Shop, Atero, Watchman, Dado, Dado, RMM. I'm not going to name them all. I'm done. Um, oh, one of the things to be aware of, by the way, that when you're doing the integration setup I mentioned before, like some people like to do an asset layout with just for that integration, right? So as you configure an integration, I do have managed setup, of course. Um, when you go into the settings of the integration, most integrations allow you to, to create sorting rules based off. So when it's a specific type of configuration in, in manage, it will go into specific asset. Um, and then if one doesn't exist, you can literally just create a new asset layout for this type and then I don't know what that device is, but Symphonics device, boom, right? Symphonics. Um, I think I actually do know what that is. <laughs> Here we just do again, we can do HP ILO. So you can literally create on the fly the asset layouts that would exist. And it's only gonna bring in that card um, at which point you can then sort it out. So uh, some of the things, some of the integrations to point out, like we have Avic and oh my God, there are so many devices. <laughs> it just, we had the de default device go into an asset layout we actually use, and it was the worst mistake because it just cluttered the hell out of everything. So what we end up doing is create a, create a base asset for the primary sync location, and then use your rules to sort the ones you actually care about into the ones that actually need to be in the places you want them to be in. Um, so that is, yeah, that's integrations. That's the other thing I want to talk about integrations. Um, what else was on our article? Uh, processes, templates, and global onboarding. All right. So this is the thing that, um, is it, by the way, this URL, this is public. one of the public sharing things I talked about earlier. You can turn off globally or you can turn off per group. Basically, you can generate a, a link. You can make a private again. You can regenerate a new one if someone has it or is not supposed to have it. And what this link does is it allows anyone, literally, to just pull up that document that worked out really well in a non signed in window. And it just shows you an overview of that document. Now, for anyone paying attention and bonus points if you've actually noticed this, the MSP Geek Code of Conduct is shared out through the website using this exact method. Um, let's see how quickly I can get it to load so I can show you. But it's literally just a document in our Hoodoo that is then screen popped out into iframe and this is it does it look familiar it you should. can tell it's by our beautiful logo at the top that looks like it's missing two dots but it's not <laughs> we could fix that again we got custom css stuff um you just change the logo to be white and the white one or we can just use the white logo yeah <laughs> and then you've got like again this table of contents that are created automatically and then of course the call outs that exist right so this is how it's all, you know, that's, this is the public sharing thing you can use for the documents, which takes us into processes. Okay. So we've created a process template. The way processes work are as follows. And I might get this wrong because I've only touched them a few times, but um, there are, there's a process template first. Okay. That process template can either be global or it can be per partner, client, organization, whatever. And then the idea is, is that, or I should say at its core and the original, the original design of the process was that you run a process against an asset. Let's say you have a new user onboarding process and you also have a user asset because it's syncing from 365 or you're creating it or some coming from your TSA or whatever it is. You have a person asset, you have an onboarding and offboarding process. You 
go to the asset and you start the process to onboard that person. That onboarding process will include the steps required to getting their email license, getting them signed in, giving them the software that they need and so on and so forth. As you complete the process, well, let me just show you. The other things that you can do, what they started after that is that they decided to allow you based off demand to run a process directly from our steps to not save Kyle. <laughs> this is disappointing. Give a different tab. This is this is this is create this is disappointing. Are they in a different tab that you did? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh running no, that's not it. This is the one we're in. All right. This is admin. There's no other tab here. Well, in any case, we'll just create it here. What are steps that we would need to build for? I don't think I did this last time. Okay, first we have to plan, right? What was it? I'm in the wrong. Uh, we have to figure out the topic. Let's see, planning the topic, right? And then we have to pick announce, a date. Announce the topic. We have to pick a date. And then we panic. You got to panic. And decide the date. And then, and then we uh, food come up and with bathroom the material. Break. <laughs> We gotta have, we gotta have food and bathroom break. All right, we'll throw that in right above here. Click on this. Food and bathroom break. All right, and then, and then go live. Now Change notice to go live as I as I'm doing this. Right in each of these areas, you have the full again rich text field stuff here. So you can do callouts, <clears throat> and we can do other headers and so on and so forth. Um, and then we can do like, now notice I'm like continuing to type. I don't want this to be in a call out, but I can just change it to a paragraph later, right? I can close that. And then, um, Okay, um, basically just, let's see if I can save this and actually have it stick this time. So I'm gonna save changes. All right, cool. And now we have the process, okay? There's like a split layout here. So you can like move things up and down. Uh, but basically as you go through each one, the details of what you put in will show up here. All right, so you can create your process of how to, like what to do along the way as you do it. And like I said, what they allowed you to do is they allowed you to do generic processes that you can run independently. It's not a template. You can still convert it to a template. So you go back to the original design where you're running the a process template off of a asset. Um, but in this case, just to showcase what I'm talking about, we're just gonna run it through here. So I'm gonna plan the topic. We've already got that done. We're, we're talking about who do, right? What I wish I knew. And notice that I can write a completion note saying, who do update completion note and then boom here's the completion note here is completed by uh and then mendy green on the time and date and i'm going to go through we're going to announce the topic we did that thoroughly i don't need a completion note for that we definitely panicked and we have the material somehow and i think kyle got his food and bathroom break and now we are going live and now we have the process complete okay now that i've done that i need to go put in my time entry for my notes because everything has to go into the ticket and I just spent all my time in the Hoodoo. So what am I gonna do? Well, on the very top, there's a copy completed tasks button. Okay, notice down here it says copied. I'm just gonna throw up notepad real quick if I can spell it correctly. And I'm just gonna paste that into that ticket and I'm done. So I have the ticket timer running in the background. I'm in Hoodoo, I'm going through the process. I'm literally putting my notes, I'm completing stuff. And then I copy using that button and any notes that I put in will be copied along with it. I just paste it into the ticket. Dear client, here's where we are. If I haven't completed the process, I started it. process, here's where we stand. Boom. Okay, guess what? For an extra bonus, you can include this link right here. Okay, we're gonna copy that link and throw it up again in incognito. And they will get this link. You throw it at the end of the ticket and they say, hey, here's the process status. 
Boom. They can see how far you've gone. They can see your notes, I think. They can't see your notes. <laughs> they can see where, where you're at and how far along you have left to go as long as well as what time and date the actual each step was completed. Um, so yeah, that is the processes that exist in Hoodoo. And that's what Ben wanted me to show you earlier, I think, um, yeah. when he was talking about the live update stuff. Notice it's auto refreshing in the background. So I'm just going to move this over here and I'm just going to mark this as un uncompleted because I actually didn't do that. And we didn't panic that bad. So I'm going to turn that off too. Um, if we come back here and just wait, we should see it auto refresh at some point. My hands are off the keyboard. How long are we going to wait for it to auto refresh? <laughs> Come on. It's not doing it. I'm just gonna, at five. I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. Oh, 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 I didn't do it yet. Boom. Auto refreshed and it showed you real time the status of what I didn't hit it with my foot either. Right. But I almost did. Um, it shows you real time where you're at with that process. So it's updated live. If the customer ever wants to know where you are after their update, they just open that link and say, Hey, where are you? Oh, look, I see you're working on it again. You know, so that's something that you can, make visible to them. It's very easy. There's no login. It's just a quick, it's a secure link randomly generated. And when you're done, you just, you can get rid of it, reset share token, and then they can't access it anymore. Um, it's better than the Domino's track. Mandy, can you put plan dates on this? Um, so it's not like a scheduling tool necessarily it's basically like i have a ticket i'm gonna go work on that ticket and i'm gonna go complete the steps on the process ideally you're completing all the steps on the process in one shot in some cases you're not gonna be able to you're waiting on licensing or whatever um i don't think you can set a plan date in that situation uh but yeah, i guess but that goes on the it, ticket the next it, time you follow up on that ticket true but it'd be nice to to be able to present to the um, client like when you expect yeah. to hit that yeah, you know what? Again, I don't know why I'm arguing with you. We should just make a feature request. Who you know what? I'm going to do it right now. Fantastic about turning feature requests around. Um, okay, so that's processes, kind of, right? That's like processes within the client. Again, we haven't really touched templates. Notice over here, there's an onboarding process that we have, okay? That's an onboarding process that we created that is global. It is a template, it's a global template, and we've marked it as an onboarding process. Anytime you create a client in Hoodoo, it's going to list that process and say, hey, you have to complete this process, it's an onboarding process. And it's gonna wait for you to click it so you can actually start that process. I don't know what's inside here, so I might close it out real quick. Um, no, it's fine. And then you can see like, this is the vendor request. When we get vendor requests, we complete this process, document it, we give them the URL, if it's gonna take a while and we show them what's going on. Um, and then we can see which clients have completed the onboarding processes and which ones haven't or how far along they are. At. So that way we can easily know who we have to go back to and so on and so forth. So the way you do that, again, only admins can actually create global processes. Um, I don't know where they are, here we are, global process templates. And then you just basically create, you know, Uh, on that side note, please go up with my plan date for processes feature requests. <laughs> Inside here, you would basically have the same UI as to what we showed you earlier. We would just edit the tasks, create the stuff, and then the same rich text field. Um, this is the global information. When we add a task, we'll get that field. So this is like the rich, like this is the basic description and whatnot of the process. Um, and then this is where you actually put the details of each task that you're doing. Okay, so we're going to put down here is where you would mark it as an onboarding process or not. If you don't have it marked as an onboarding process, you can still use it. So this is a global process template. I'm just going to add in one, one step and it's just going to be like create feature request, right? I'll do two steps and then upvote feature request. Publish feature requests for upvotes. Okay, we'll save those changes. And then... Um, hey, maybe we have a good question. Yeah. Uh, do you get to name the process each time when you run it again? Like, can you edit the name so that it's 
like let's you know in this example you're like three we'll steps ahead because i'm what i'm going to show you guys is moving from a global process template into a template for the client into running the template against an asset so we'll go through it and you'll see that um we're just going to call this something submitting feature requests so that we can actually identify it and not get confused and then save changes so we have i think if i refresh it yep submitting feature requests we've got our two steps create feature publish feature request it's not an onboarding process it is a global template not an onboarding process okay we're going to go back to the partner mendy online and then i'm going to go to processes and i'm going to create a new template here all right so I'm going to click new and then it's going to say, do you want to start from a global process template? And I'm going to say, yes, I'm going to create from template submitting feature requests. And now it's going to say, okay, do you want to change that template at all? Or do you want to just use it the way it is? Okay. So I don't want to use it the way it is. I don't want to change it either. I want to convert it to a template. Now it's going to be a client template. Notice I cannot mark things complete anymore. Okay. Um, I can still edit the tasks because it is a template I can change, but I can't actually run the process. Uh, yes, Ian. So for example, here's some features. So I'm gonna go to our network devices and I want a feature request for Netgear switch that's not real to actually become real. So I'm gonna click new process here and it's gonna say, what process do you wanna use? You wanna start process based off template and here is the template we're going to use, right? I don't actually know what this button does. Oh, it actually used the only one that was available. Okay. So now that we're here, notice it named it automatically for the asset layout. And you can edit that um, over here for a switch that isn't real. And then you can go add additional tasks that are required for the one-off switch thing that you're doing um, with different names. as you go. And then we're gonna save those changes. And then you can go through and complete that task for that switch. Now, if you go back to that asset, you'll see that right here. And you can see there's zero out of five completed. Okay. So it allows you to actually easily open up and run the processes based off a template. And you can quickly change the template on the fly if you need to for whatever it is that you're running on. And then the last thing about it, again, as an admin, is that you're actually able to look and see which processes have completed, how many of them are left, and how many of them are outstanding. So from an admin perspective, you can go, you can go see what's going on. Um, Chris, I'm not sure I understand your question about mass applying those to assets because they would have to be run each time. So if you're going to an asset to do a setup, you go into the workstation and then run the asset, the process against the specific asset. So it's a manual run you're doing against the asset. So I'm not sure what you mean about mass applying it. Um, there is actually in the beta version that I'm on. Yeah, you have to go to each individually and run. Yes, but on the beta version that we're running, that's going to come out to general release soon. They've instituted the ability to fire off a process from the API. So if you have a automation, so let's say Imibot, right? <laughs> it's doing automatic setup of workstations and stuff, and it's completing a process for you. You can document what that process is. And as Imibot clears each stage, you can have it, A, fire off the process initially, and then mark each step complete. If something gets missed, <laughs> you know why. Um, and at least you, it allows you to demonstrate, again, auditing is where everything is at, right? So it gives you like an audit trail of the things that you're doing automatically. Uh, against the asset individually. So um, API control of the processes exists in the beta version we're on. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Your fault. <laughs> um, and that's it. So that's processes and process templates and global templates and so on and so forth. Um, what else is on our document? We were like 20 minutes over. Should we stop or should we keep going? I, don't I mean, know there's still have... 13 people here. Okay. Let's at least finish the overview. All right. What's what else do we have? Where's my document? Uh, who wants your overview? Here we go. I'm just disappointed. I gave my link out and no one updated my uploaded my. <laughs> it's fine. I understand. 
Documents versus assets. This is a great question. It's something that we need to consider. I think I've covered on this briefly. What, what information goes into a document and what information goes into an asset? Um, because again, this is one of the challenges that we had initially before we actually had a real, a real system that we, we have for documenting. And the question is like, if you don't have a good system in place, then uh, it's going to get messy. <laughs> and if information is going to be, some information is going into documents, other information is going to the assets, you're not going to know where to find it. It's, gonna, it's not going to be good. So you have to really think about and design your structure around that question. Like what is going to go into documents? What's going to go into assets? I can tell you one of the things that most helped me um, was a while back, I was going through and I actually stumbled on a website called Process Street. A uh, very expensive that. product, but great product. Um, and they have a free, like public blog with all sorts of very helpful articles. And I read like 15 of them. <laughs> um, and I came away realizing like, listen, we're doing it all wrong, right? So like we're technicians, we don't really know proper documentation, at least in, in, in telecom's case. Um, but we've basically been writing these massive articles I'm like oh, okay yeah it's documented go read it like no one's no one's going to do that um and there was a differentiation that was created like listen you have to you have to determine the types of documents you're creating and this is something i'm outlining in our standards for our text as they document stuff and create kbs and 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 notes and assets is that if you are creating a process that's being followed not necessarily a process because it's a procedure that we have to do during a, during a specific thing, even if it's just like a technical fix, right? If there's a known issue or something like that, and there's a technical fix on how to fix it, there's a process on what to do to fix that issue, you have to keep it short and sweet. You do not, you should not be mixing up the background of the issue along with the steps required to fix the issue. Because as a technician, if you're on the phone with a client or clients expecting a call back in five minutes and you're expecting to quick, fix it quickly, you don't want to get hung up on the details and have to read a 30 minute article and figure out how to fix it. If I see that, I'm just gonna go ask the person who did it how to fix it because I need it fixed quickly. What you should do is have step-by-step -step directions on what to do. And then on a separate area, either on the same article broken out by a different heading, or on a different article entirely, like a different area, depending on what it is, you can create the procedures or the technical background or the lengthy details. There's a difference between process, which is generally gonna be something that needs to be refer referenced all the time in order for, to make sure nothing gets missed. The process should be short and sweet and the procedure and policies should be long and in depth because that's something I'm gonna read once I'm going to understand the point behind it. And then I'm going to refer back to the, pro the process each time to make sure I'm doing it correctly. Right. But if I have them mixed up, then I'm, I'm going to miss something. I'm going to get stuck reading something. It's not, it's not a very good situation. So that's something that I can tell you. Hopefully it helps you guys. Um, it definitely got us stuck up a lot because we were just throwing it all out. Like we just sat there, we wrote an hour long document of everything that was wrong and how to fix it. And it was just ridiculous. Um, so being able to differentiate that is actually hopefully helpful for us. We'll, we'll find out in the future. <laughs> um, document formatting, we discussed that. As is a website, even wondering, okay, so my website should be finished parsing right now. Let's take a look at it. Yep, it's been, uh, expires in 224 days. I'm running, we're using Let's Encrypt. It's online, we're getting a 200K response. Um, and you can see like it captures all that information. So. Uh, one thing I haven't showed you is that if you go to admin and then create, okay, two things. I mentioned I was going to come back to this, so I'll come back to it real quick. Um, that is a fantastic question. I don't know, but I'm like 90% sure it's, let's encrypt. Let's find out. Uh, Oh, because it's Cloudflare in front of that. Duh, I'm an idiot. Cloudflare, it is Let's Encrypt, but Cloudflare is in front of it. That makes sense. Um, okay, so there's alerts. But before we go into <laughs> before we go into alerts, I'm going to go back into expirations I mentioned. In the very beginning, we'd come back to it. 
uh, in the under asset layouts, you have a field type you can throw in um, that we can do called date or something. I think it's this. And then down here, we have an option to add to expirations. So you check this box and it will create a monitor for it. So you can put a date like subscription renewal or license renewal, or even potentially a uh, re-review for standard, right? So if you're supposed to do an annual check on all devices to make sure that the configuration is up to spec, you can throw in a date field and make sure every time it gets renewed, you push that out one year um, or so on and so forth. And then add it to expiration so that way when it comes up, it alerts you that it's coming up. Okay, so now that I've like blown through that real quick, what does that mean alert you? Well, we have alerts under admins that we can create. Um, and these, I'm not even sure they actually work right now. They're supposed to be fixed in this version, I think. Uh, but basically you can create uh, for any kind of alert that exists here, you can do a single expiration. You can choose what you wanna um, expire, what, what you wanna alert for, or you can do a list of all the expirations. Um, and then again, what to do with the alert, or you can send a webhook, including variables that exist. So, yeah, that is a good point, right? What happens to SSL monitoring when it's Cloudflare is in front of it? And the answer is, um, if you're doing Cloudflare deployment correctly, which I guarantee you I'm not, then you have Cloudflare's privately signed certificate installed on the web server. So the expiration and renewal happens through Cloudflare. They'll let you know about it. Um, I'm using Let's Encrypt and it auto renews. And if it fails and I break the trust, then I'm going to know about it because when I go to create a post, <laughs> then my website's not going to load or something. Uh, but yeah, that's a good point. Um, the thing about this using variables in webhooks is that are, these variables are tuned for the type of expiration you're doing. So if you're doing like a one time shared password reveal, you have different record name and who do URL. If you have password create updated, you get an action as well. Website down is the website name and website who do URL. Okay. But here's the thing they don't tell you is that these variables work regardless of what type of alert you're setting up. So if it exists here, I can use it in here. Um, they're just examples and the, your, the variable may not expand to anything. <laughs> but if you're using something like who do URL, that'll always work because it's going to be the asset of wherever whatever it is that's expiring. Um, so that's how you set up alerts. We would have like a Teams notification or a webhook URL hitting maybe Roost or Halo or something like that to generate the ticket um, that would come through from that alert. Okay, that was, where are we? I'm scared to move things around on my screen. I don't know what's behind it. Let's go back here and go back to the document. That's alerts and expirations. Um, what else do we have? API access and PowerShell module. We are, <laughs> we are a half hour over, I think. Right? Yeah. Should we go, should we talk about the PowerShell module that has been created by Luke? Yeah. Yes, Ray says yes. Okay. Uh, for anyone who doesn't already know, Luke, Whitelock is someone who got a little frustrated at a client we won't at a vendor we won't name, and basically ripped off all of Kelvin Cyberdrain's stuff. So if anyone doesn't know Cyberdrain, that's a whole different story. You got to go catch up. Cyberdrain has, but Kelvin has fantastic scripts for auto documenting between Data RMM and IT Glue. Um, Luke went and ripped off the entire site and created everything for Hoodoo, and then also created a Hoodoo PowerShell module around it at the same time. So you can see all kinds of things that he has here. Here's his Hoodoo folder and categories, all the kinds of things he has for auto documenting stuff. Um, now, I mentioned in the beginning, there's a struggle that I have regarding, this sounds like a cheap face. I mentioned in the beginning, a struggle that we had regarding like how to tell when documentation that you're auto, like auto documentation that you're doing. Is it documenting what's there right now or is it documenting what should be, right? That's one of the questions I had. Um, 
which kind of made me leery about auto documentation for a while. But I then, while I was building the standards and, I, and I'm standardizing, I'm like, wait a second, when I have standards on assets, when everything is standardized, you can just fill in the fields automatically. So instead of doing auto documentation on an ongoing basis, we can, especially because as you build standards and they have to go through all the different assets, it takes a while to actually document something correctly. Instead of doing it, we can have a script created around a specific type of asset that projects department will run manually one time. So they set it up the way it's scoped out, the way it's supposed to. Instead of them having to spend the time creating all the different documentation stuff, they just run the script. And they pass in var variables at the time um, <clears throat> so that it can connect to whatever it is that they're doing inventory stuff and then post it into the correct asset in Hudu. So that's like a compromise we did where we allow auto documentation that saves projects time, um, but it also isn't constantly changing. So it doesn't break the what should be versus what is um, question. So I'm not gonna show you the scripts that I'm using for that. All I'm gonna do is show you A, how to install the PowerShell module. Hopefully you guys already know that. If not, cool, I'll show it to you. B, I'm not a PowerShell expert by any means. Don't um, even, just connect to PowerShell. Let's, we, we, you, I'm gonna done, show you yeah, how you're to fine. manipulate PowerShell to doing what, should, what you wanna do. Um, all right, so first thing that we need to do is we need an API key, all right? That's done under admin again, under API here. And for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to limit the API key to um, my public IP address, <clears throat> which uh, if you don't know, you can just pull up PowerShell and do an ipinfo.io for slash JSON if it's PowerShell 7, and then you have your public IP. Now everyone can go hack me. And we're going to copy that out. Actually, PowerShell 7, I think you have to control C. We're gonna throw this in here and then Mendy test API key. And I'm not gonna have password destructive actions. I'm just gonna create the key. All right, so we have PowerShell in here, right? And I'm just gonna import module Hudu API. I don't have it or I spelled it wrong. Boom. If you don't have it already installed, it's literally just install module Hudu API, and then followed by the import module of Hudu API. Um, to get started, all you're doing is you're just going to set, I'm just going to set this as a variable real quick. Uh, yeah, okay. And then we do new Hudu API key, followed by API key, and then new Hudu base URL, followed by the URL of the Hudu thing, and it failed for some reason. We on beta? Maybe it may be a beta thing, or did I spell something wrong? Let's try this. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Well, if it fails because of some reason, wow. Um, maybe PowerShell 7 thing. Hold on, let's switch to PowerShell. It's not, how can you connect to ours if it's limited by IP? Hey, he got you. <laughs> okay, I was like, what? I didn't even read it till, it may be set Hudu API key. Um, here, let's just first import module Hudu API. And now I'm like, uh, get commands module. Let's see what the commands are. Uh, here's get. Here's a new Hudu API key. And 
it's, no, uh, it's it's new. It's new Hudu API key and new Hudu base URL, um, which doesn't show up here. It is. Am I might just blind? Oh, there it is. Yeah, I'm just blind. Okay, let's try this again. So API key equals that, and There's then a space at the end of that. Uh, oh sh maybe now now I'm lost. That could be why it failed to connect. No, there's no space. What? There looks like there's a space. There's no space. I, I understand that now, but there look like there's a space okay. between. You hit API key, API key. That's not. And then new Hulu base URL is. There we go. Oh. No. Do I need to do that? No. Do I need to remove HPS? I can't believe Luke hasn't run into this already because he's on the beta too. Unless I'm just doing something really wrong and I just can't think of it right now. You know what? We're going to open a uh, ticket with Luke. Yeah, we're going to find out what the heck's happening here. That's the base you're on the program. I just tried it with and without. But no, usually not. You're not running PowerShell as admin? No, I don't need to run as admin to connect to web service to do stuff on the web. I'm not a client or end user. Um, I mean, I might be in this case. Who knows? All right. Well, that was a short demo. <laughs> but we got it. We did it. We went over it. Uh, it's super useful and we utilize it. You should utilize it too. Here's the thing, though. The API docs that exist are very poor. Actually, it's right here. No, I left that screen. So, like, this should work, technically speaking. Let's let's try this real quick. Hold on. Let's let's go off. Let's go off script. Oh God. Uh, I don't know how to do this. How do I do this, Kyle? Um, X API key, right? If I can spell that correctly equals and then the string. All right, so now I have my header. And then I'm going to do results equals invoke rest method. And then base uh, URI is going to be uh, docs.mspgeek.com forward slash API v1 companies sure page equals one. And then headers, header method get. Okay, and then con uh, content type application JSON, I think. Is that case sensitive? Who knows? <laughs> okay, I'm guessing this is a bug in in the uh, in the dev version. The beta. Yeah, I'm gonna check something real quick. I'm gonna take this off screen, guys. Sorry. I'm gonna create a new API key without that's not limited by IP. Uh, wait a second. Um, our Hudu is behind Cloudflare. It is. So it could be seeing an invalid source IP address. Oh, that's yeah, that's true. But let's just see this real quick. What happens? Just because this is driving nuts, and now I feel bad. Haha, <laughs> we are connected. Okay. All right. Moving on. So now I can do get who do companies. It's basically like anyone who knows PowerShell is um you know, it's like it's what it's it's verb dash noun, right? So I'm gonna get the Hoodoo company, basically. And if you saw me earlier, you can just do get command and then module Hoodoo API to see what options you can do. Um, so if you want to get like all passwords, then you can just literally let's just not do, let's not get who do passwords. I don't have access to them. Right, bad credentials. Okay, but like you're you're working. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can do get who do companies, and then I can do name, uh, Mendy online, whatever the heck I called it. What was Mendy it? online automation yesterday or something? Yeah. 
for some reason. I don't I think that was a test. Boom, I have my thing. And then it gets obviously returns a, an object. So the thing is, is like Sesame Street. What? Yeah, an address. <laughs> <laughs> So I can do this and then I can say, well, what are the uh, what are the different objects that we have here? And notice there's a notes there, right? So I'm just gonna grab the notes real quick. Boom, it's HTML. So I can be like, uh, standard notes equals company dot notes. And then I can do get who do company <laughs> and then set who do company. <laughs> and then I can set the, um, the notes here somewhere, I think. Boom. And just be like standard notes. And then I can, from three or four You're, commands, I can standardize our notes across the board. Aren't you getting ready to set all of the companies with <laughs> yeah, that? Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Okay. No, Let's I'm not, not. I'm not pressing enter. This is a live environment, guys. So we're not actually okay, going to do delete it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Chris, if it had dumped all the passwords, I would have been like, oops. <laughs> I would have been like, I would have been. Stop the share, stop the share. <laughs> Delete from YouTube. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so these are things that you can just like, we can build um, the assets that you're trying to so like, Let's say you have, here, let's let's actually be serious for a second. So we have a an asset layout that we created uh, called network devices, right? So. We're gonna let's just grab all network ass all all who do asset layouts. Boom. Okay. Now, obviously, if there's too many of them, this doesn't help me. I need to be able to be able, I need to be able to read this. So I'm just gonna pull this and then we're just gonna do this again. And then we can say, well, I want to find a name. So I'm just gonna select name. Okay, we want the name of network devices, right? That's the one that I created. So we're just gonna do this and say, where, or I'll, just, I'll type it out so people can read that. Where.name equals, that is not what we wanna paste. <laughs> Nobody caught nice. that, right? <laughs> nice. Um, and then I can see that this is the device I wanna see. There's something called fields. Okay, so this is where we start to say, okay, what do I need to figure out in order to put information into the field, right? So I'm going to say, well, we know the asset layout that we want is the network asset layout. So we're going to say network asset layout equals, and I'm just repeating the same commands. I'm just iterating over something I've already done as I figure it out. Now I can say network asset layout dot fields. And I, yeah, I definitely spelled it wrong, but it's okay because PowerShell auto completed. And here we can see all the fields that exist. Now, I don't need all this crap, right? The only thing I need is the label of the field so that I can figure out what I'm going to call my object as I post it, OK? So I'm going to do uh, dot field select label. And here are the fields that I need to fill out, OK? I don't need the banner notice unless one of the things that I've done is as I auto document something, I actually have the script check that off and put a banner saying, this has been auto documented so that we have to go clear that manually just to confirm everything is correct. Um, so we can easily spot that, that on the list. But this is, these are the list of fields that we have to create. So I'm gonna create a, a new object real quick and it's gonna be a PS custom object. And we're gonna create equals the object and then we'll create the way the API works is that, um, I don't remember. I don't remember if the field names are underscored for the spaces or if they're hyphened. So we're gonna cancel this out actually. And I'm gonna get who do asset layout and company or let's see, name. I can search by name. So I know the name because we have the neck here that I created basically. So I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna go here to this and I'm gonna literally base switch one necker S3300 and copy that, paste it here. And I'm just gonna call this example asset. That's what I need to copy basically. Now I have my example asset that did not find it. Wow. Um, okay. 
Why didn't that find it? Oh, I know why, because it's not a layout. It's get who do assets. I wasn't going to say anything. I was just going to wait till you figured it out. I figured it out. What's the problem? No, and then if you look sure. at fields, you'll see the exact same thing, which doesn't help me because it doesn't tell me if I need to do it in hyphens or underscores. I don't remember. Well, this is when we switch back to the browser and say, let's go here. And we're going to pull up DevTools. Developer tools for a browser are usually helpful. Let's see if they come through for me right now. And I'm not going to bother wasting my time redoing all this stuff, right? So I'm just going to I have the network ca capture running. So I can actually see the put that just happened. I can see the payload, right? Name is the name. Great. And then I'm going to, it's going to stay running. I'm just going to duplicate this thing. Create. And now we have a post somewhere here. This post, I think, should have the payload. Oh, that's annoying. It doesn't actually put back everything. Ah. Mm. Hold on. OK, never mind. I'm going to make a new one from scratch. Test and I have to put in an IP address. So we'll just do one on one and then we'll save that. Now we should have a post here, payload, and it's underscores, it looks like. So we're going to clear this out. We're going to go back here and finish this up. We'll do the following. Um, New object, oh, PS custom object. New object equals blah, blah, blah. And then we'll do um, IP address equals 4.2.2.2. That's not a, and then we'll do Mac address equals XXCC, OO, AA, blah, 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 whatever. And then we can do, uh, physical info equals, and then we can actually put in a standard note. What was it? Um, what was that? Notes. Yeah, was that what I did? I thought I did that. Well, that's going to put out the uh, missed a quarter of the mega address. Did I miss something? Yeah, I misquoted. it. Yeah, yeah, I did. I'm like, why is that not syntax incorrectly? There you go. Boom. So it's going to put out the HTML. And then I'm just going to end, end that object. So now we have a new object, right? And that gives a new Hudu asset. Now I need to figure out the asset layout ID that I'm going to be doing, right? I need to figure out a couple of things. So asset layout ID, I know because I have the asset already, right? Dot something here is going to be ID, boom. I need to figure out the name of the asset, which I'm just going to call another new device. And then I have to figure out the company ID, which I know I have because I have company in here somewhere, right? Company.id, something right there. And then fields. And then that's going to be the new object that's going to be created. And I'm going to prep this into a variable just so I can see what happens. And then results one, results one, boom, there's my asset. And here's it created, here it's created. So literally, without looking at any docs and basic knowledge of PowerShell, barely, <laughs> um, just some engineering around like how the API specifically works and how the fields work, I'm able to create a device. And now if I go here, I should have a third device created. Uh, fourth, apparently, because I have a duplicate I forgot about. And here's the, another new device with the iPad is 4.2.2.2. And if I go into here, I should have, uh, it did not like my HTML. <laughs> I don't know why. It didn't like my HTML. 
Well, we can always try again. Yeah, it Let's... could be the escape characters. Yeah, it could be. I didn't. Yeah, I don't know the specifics. Need to sanitize them or whatever. What did it do for here? Oh, I I put it on the header. That's not going to work. I think. Let's go back to here real quick. No, physical location. What did I put it under? Physical info. Yeah, I did it wrong. That's why. So I can just recreate my object again real quick and change this to be physical location instead of physical info. So yeah, you can't put HTML on a header field because the header is not going to contain any values. <laughs> and then I can do this again and I can actually um, set uh, who do asset like that. And then I can just do my results or right, see what the things are name. It's going to be results dot asset dot name. Right. And then I can do company ID is going to be results. Cause this is, this is the response I got back when I created the asset. So it's going to have everything I need basically. Um, and then asset layout ID is going to be the same thing. Results one dot asset dot asset layout ID followed by fields, which I'm just going to do the new object. I'm going to overwrite everything I have in there right now. And I forgot the asset ID. <laughs> uh, let's try this one more time. You'll get it eventually. Asset ID is going to be asset. No, it's going to be results. Dot asset dot asset. No, dot ID, I think. Yeah. Um, there's my new asset. I didn't save it this time, so I can't check it, unfortunately. But let's go look at the actual result of it and see if I got my notes in there this time. Bum, bum, bum. Let's see, Chris, it could be, it's not gonna come through, but I should at least have something, I think. Boom, there you go. HTML came through and everything. That's it. Right, so you can easily build a script for like feeding it. Like I'm thinking about just feeding it Excel spreadsheets, right? People and projects it's easier to build out spreadsheets than it is to jump through all the different layouts and stuff. You have a, a spreadsheet of assets. You have all the information that inside the spreadsheet. They fill it out and they just run import CSV pipe to run who to import, <laughs> and boom, all your stuff's done. Um, so yeah. Those are things that we're looking at. Um, Luke on his website has an Aruba instant on script. We basically stole half of that. And instead of running it automatically, we run it on demand. So the projects guy pastes in the site GUID for the Aruba instant on controller, which tells it which client it's for. They choose the client to run it on. And um, the script will automatically, it runs in automate. <laughs> the script automatically grabs the Aruba login credentials from Hudu and then documents every single inventory in, in the, uh, every single asset that's inventory in, in Aruba instant on it puts it into Hudu. And yeah, I mean, even for simple things like renaming assets or changing one field across a bunch of assets, like the, the PowerShell module makes it really easy to use. So good call, Ray. All right, guys, I think that's uh, it, right? Short that's of two it. hours. I think that's it. Yeah. So um, thank you all for watching. Looks like I kept most of your attention the entire time. It's pretty good. And too, yeah, for two hours. Now I need to go drink like a lot of water. <laughs> yep. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, we uh for those of you who maybe hadn't sat through the whole thing or whatever we will be uh editing and putting it up on youtube uh as always uh we have another geek cast scheduled uh for yes. july the 20th the next episode of halo psa geek cast with luke what and I, I wish i knew episode two for halo it's going to be on july 20th at 4 p.m eastern time um who do is a fantastic piece of software um it allows for so many things to happen um 
and they're a huge part of the community. It's a, a super cool thing to do. Um, it's a super cool thing to be a part of. Uh, Jacob, right, is uh, always yeah. involved. Jacob always in this channel. Pretty responsive. Um, Supports like, very responsive. The feature requests come out. They've slowed down their releases, as you know, but they've also been working on some really heavy lifting. So it makes sense. And delete the API key. Yeah, I need to kill that API key. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, Is it somewhere? <laughs> It's on the internet now. Everyone has it. Um, so thank you again for coming. Um, we'll see you uh, hopefully in July, uh, the other, at the end of July. And uh, you guys have a fantastic evening.